Lunch today is with a legendary trader, famous for his contrarian shot during the global financial crisis. Now, he's a self-professed investor with another contrarian strategy built around four idiosyncratic and uncorrelated opportunities. I've traded global financial markets and advised of Asia's wealthiest for more than 20 years. Yet, I'm constantly in search of new perspectives on finance, business, and of course, life. So I book tables and put wine on my tab just to bring you some food for thought. Hi, Hi Steve, how are you? I'm very well, how are good you doing? Good to see you, I'm good, I'm good. Hi, my name is Ruben, I'm the Sake Samale. Prep for you yeah, today, for sure. it's nominee Juma Denginjo Omachi. It's a popular flower and foodie sake with sweetness right in the middle. So whereabouts in Japan is this? Nara, sir. Okay, right. It's interesting you serve it in a wine glass, right? Oh, with all the aromatics, it's a lot more appreciable in a wine glass. Please. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's have a sniff. This quaint sake bar in the middle of Singapore's business district serves up a Spanish twist on the Japanese izakaya. It's the kind of curious mix of East and West. I hope a contrarian like Steve will enjoy. Cheers. Good health. So vulpes is the Latin for fox. There's a Greek fable, and it's called The Fox and the Hedgehog. The fox knows many clever things. And a bit like Wile E. Coyote is always trying to catch the hedgehog. The hedgehog only knows one thing, but it's a really important thing, which is he rolls up into a ball, which is spiky, and the fox is always foiled by this. When I was at Oxford many years ago as a student, I read this essay called The Fox and the Hedgehog, which was looking at people and thinkers in the world as either foxes or hedgehog. Karl Marx, as an example, is the ultimate hedgehog, right? He had one idea in his entire life, but it completely changed the world. Whereas someone like Aristotle wrote everything, politics, biology, theatre criticism. I'm not comparing myself to Aristotle, but... Uh, <laughs> but you are the fox. <laughs> I was always more the fox. Yeah. But when I came to Singapore in 2002, and I set up this hedge fund with my you know, partner, uh, Richard McGiddies, we ended up being the ultimate hedgehog because we ended up just doing one thing, you know, the, the big short, which is now famous because of Michael Lewis's book. I mean, we were the Asian short. We were the Asian The Asian guys. big short. We were really unpopular at cocktail parties, right? Because we were always <laughs> this prophet of doom saying, oh, well, you might as well enjoy things while they're going, because it's going to get terribly bad. And, it, and when it did get bad, I mean, it got worse really quickly and worse than even we had imagined it could. Wiley considered the worst global economic crisis since the Great Depression. The global financial crisis ignited in the American housing market and spread across most of the developed world. Using a long volatility, short credit strategy to bet on a downturn, Steve minted money during the meltdown. The fund peaked at nearly 4.9 billion US dollars late in 2008. In 2009, along with James Simmons, George Soros and Ray Dalio, Steve made the list of Forbes Wall Street's highest earners. You know, being on the inside of that, you realise just how fragile the system was, how close it came to really Complete, falling apart. Yeah. By the end of 2009, we were pretty confident everything was going to be OK. We weren't going to see systemic defaults. Governments had managed to restore confidence in the system. Then we started to have to question this strategy that we'd had. Was that going to carry on working? The hedgehog realizes that the one thing the he knows. The one thing he knows is not going to be okay for the next. And 10 we years. had nowhere else to go because the only thing we did was this. So in 2010, we decided we would shut the hedge fund, even though we still had at the time two and a half billion dollars under management. People really did think we were crazy, but. I just didn't want to do it for another 10 years because of this curiosity that I've just got about the world. And I felt that if we're in a new world, then new opportunities were going to be coming up. And I wanted to try and think of how I would be exposed to those. Edamame with, with chicken skin and chicken skin. 
I'm looking forward. You know, when one of my sons was uh, six, seven, this is the only part of the chicken he would want to eat. It's the skin. He would swap his meat for everyone else's skin. I was a little worried about him, actually. <laughs> In 2011, Steve started his family office, Volpus Investment Management, to manage wealth in a more sustainable and multi-generational way. The four Volpus funds are each designed to capture a specific investment opportunity and as a whole, aim to preserve and grow capital whilst offering downside protection and non-correlation. We've had this philosophy for the last 10 years to kind of avoid the big bulge in the middle of stocks and bonds, which we felt for at least seven or eight years have represented poor value. So what that's done is it's pushed us into what a lot of people would regard as, you know, idiosyncratic assets. And we've focused on what we describe as a barbell approach. So on the risky side, venture capital in Southeast Asia and biotechnology, which we focused almost entirely on the UK. The safe side is composed of things that most other people wouldn't recognize because the big bulk of what people would normally put in their safe bucket, which is bonds, we see as incredibly unsafe. You look at a German bond right now, 10 year German bonds yielding negative a quarter of a percent a year. So you're gonna lose two and a half percent over the 10 years, plus inflation. That's not safe, that's suicide. So the safe side is composed of property, significantly in Germany, and then farmland. But Steve, just putting it in the context, right? Farming with industry is fairly high risk. You have crop diseases, drought, yep. you have changes in consumer demand, export laws can change. So there are quite a fair bit of uh, risk, right? Oh, farming is in many ways the worst investment you could ever make. So how would you look <laughs> at this and put it into your safe bucket? Right? I never advocate anyone put two or 300% of their assets into anything. For us, at about 10%, it represents an idiosyncratic asset. It's not correlated. Yes. And over the cycle, it produces good income. But you have a huge amount of volatility. And you can't just buy farmland willy-nilly, you need to have a philosophy. Our philosophy is you don't need to farm in dangerous places, marginal climates, dangerous governments, because you're going to be owning this land forever. There's a reason why we're invested these days only in Uruguay and New Zealand, and it comes back to your point about government policy. The vast majority of people don't own land and they don't produce food. So food prices going up is very unpopular. And in most democracies, it's one of the most unpopular things you can have. So governments will always be trying to keep food prices down. That's especially true in countries where they're largely importing food. Uruguay and New Zealand export almost all their food. So for them, there's no domestic pressure to keep food prices down. So we farm in places where we're largely exporting the product, in places where we feel you know, our, our land title is solid. And in times of inflation, it will represent a very good investment. Yeah, inflation's always been the boogeyman of the last 10 years, right? And it's been the boogeyman because it hasn't turned up. Yeah, it hasn't turned up. It, it hasn't, been, but it's here now. For whatever reason, this COVID stimulus has led to inflation. Right? I mean, it's real, it's the highest in 30 years, it's no longer the boogeyman, it's actually a threat to your in investments. Inflation has been a bait on investors because of its ability to erode the value of investments. Say an investment returns 3%, with inflation also at 3%, the real return will be zero. So where do you hide from inflation when it happens? The worst place, historically, and it'll be the case again, is low-yielding low government bonds and cash in the bank. Yes. Historically, the best thing is property, and that makes sense, particularly if it's got a decent yield on it. But it doesn't mean that all property is going up. You mentioned about uh, property in Germany. How do you view them? 
I'm not saying Germany's the only place to do it. We chose it specifically because it is the least exciting. And in a place where there was a minimum level of speculation, the Germans have never had a property bubble, ever. Because they don't, they don't have a notion of owning their own property, right? From what I understand, they're yeah, very the vast comfortable majority renting. Of for their whole lives. German property is occupied by Germans, most of whom have a job, almost all of whom pay the rent. It's never really occurred to them to borrow an entire lifetime's earnings. Just to, to buy, buy a property. The vast majority of Germans buy a car with cash. They barely use credit cards. It's an incredibly lowly levered system. Where we are in Germany is we're not investing like a Singaporean because we think someone's going to turn up and pay me 20% more for my apartment next year. All we're doing is we're long term owning these things for a stream of income. And if the property goes up, that's an added bonus. For us, the income looks after the uh, downside. Investors everywhere have really not had a lot of income from their investments for quite some time. But they don't care because they've had so much capital gain, everyone's feeling just great about almost everything. The problem with capital gain is unlike income, it's not sustainable. One of the tests that we always have about what we invest in and what we own, because we consider ourselves to be investors these days, not traders like we used to be, is you look at your portfolio and you say, if I couldn't sell this to someone else, if all the assets were privatized and I had to just live off these investments, how would I feel? If you feel really uncomfortable about that as, a, as, a, as an intellectual exercise, then you are not investing, you're speculating. Our main dining event is a seat at the chef's table where he prepares and serves his Spanish-Japanese blend of tapas. Hi, I'm Chef Derek. The first course is unagi sushi. Uh -huh. okay. We have grilled unagi on dehydrated rice, topped with mentaiko sauce and three types of caviar. So you're serving three pieces for two people. Do we have to fight over the <laughs> final piece? <laughs> See who eats faster. <laughs> At his family office, Volpers Investment Management, Steve has constructed a barbell strategy to build wealth with a multi-generational approach. On the safe side, he has chosen to focus on physical assets in property and farmland, while choosing to invest in startups and biotech on the risky end. Do you think that the venture capital markets in maybe this part of the world, Southeast Asia, is a bubble? I mean, there's been a lot of meaningful, you know, big exits last two years. No, I mean, I'm very, conf I'm very confident it's not a bubble. Why? Which is one of the reasons why we're investing more in it. You know, we've, we've done a bit of US venture capital, but most in Asia. And the consistent thing we see is that valuations are much better in this part of the world, which is odd because growth opportunities are better here. I, I'm not talking about markets necessarily, but demographics, right? We've got 600, 700 million people with growing incomes, good demographic wins at their back, but we've never really had a large venture capital industry in this part of the world. We had one grow up in China and to a certain extent, China cannibalized our venture capital because people just weren't interested in Southeast Asia. ASEAN is one of the largest economic zones in the world and the third fastest growing region. While venture capital activity has increased more than three times between 2010 and 2020, it pales in comparison to other Asian neighbours. We feel that for various geopolitical and government risk reasons, China is becoming a very problematic place to invest for anyone. And I think this could be Southeast Asia's great opportunity to develop more of a venture capital pool and if we develop the pool, I am certain the talent and the ambition is there to exploit it. So I do agree that geopolitics is going to be probably playing a much larger part in our investment process over the next few years than ever before. We see a lot of tension building up right in the South China Sea with Taiwan, 
So do you think there's also a risk, I mean, for Southeast Asia and for Singapore, right? Oh, there's always a risk. We're right now on the front line of this new Cold War because the chances that America and China forget their differences and go back to trading with each other and building reasonably collegiate relations are very small indeed. The chances that they will continue to become ever more frosty are more likely than not. It doesn't mean we're heading for war, but what it does mean is that the risk of a mistake, either in the Taiwan Strait or the South China Sea, goes up all the time. You combine that with the increasingly negative demographics out of China, chasing opportunities in China seems to us to be foolish, particularly as the valuations in China are still quite demanding. The valuations are really, really crazy. You don't get any discount for these risks now. You're not being offered a bargain. You never want to lose track of valuation, no matter how good a story is. You've always got to keep one eye on what you're paying for. And, uh... It's really quite good. <laughs> Guys, this is fantastic. Hello, I have something feeling for your second course. The Japanese seafood paella, the Spanish grilled octopus with onion kagiyage. On the side, here will be the yuzu kosho for you to dip the octopus. Well, thank you. Enjoy. Our main thank course. You. I think you've been caught many things in your life. One of the, the names that stuck with me was your opportunistic investment manager. How do you sense the opportunity in front of you? One of the things is I'm a natural contrarian. So my philosophy as an investor tends to be, let's look for places to invest where other people are either ignoring it or rejecting it for reasons which maybe are not so great. It also means we do have the opportunity to buy things that are not being bid up. In the early weeks of the COVID-19 pandemic, venture capital firms, like most of the world's economy, shut down threatening a capital crunch for startups. Steve and his team, however, got to work and launched a special opportunities fund with the goal of a quick raise and spend. In 18 months, the fund raised 10 million US dollars and invested in 21 startups in Southeast Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. The VC business is predominantly about investing in, in people. So you have to spend time with the people. Now, VCs used to say, we're not, we want to spend time face to face. And then COVID came along and everyone said, well, we're going to stop investing. What we did is we said, we don't think that should be a restricted factor. We don't have to physically meet you. We can feel we can get to know you over Zoom. We'll invest with you. Um, now everyone does that. But that gave us a big opportunity during COVID. We learned a huge amount. Opportunities are coming up in lots of different industries from lots of different demographics. Australia and New Zealand. Very different stage of economic development, but there are some interesting ideas coming out of that part of the world. Fintech for Vietnam, it's a huge opportunity. Indonesia has 300 million people and is going to be incredibly important as a market. So there's no reason why we should be a poor stepchild to everyone else's venture capital. Biotechnology's been a real roller coaster for investors. But in terms of contemporary investment situation, it's really all about betting on adoption. What are currently incurable diseases? Cancer, which has been one of our major focuses. What's happened in the last 10 years has been more than the other 60 previous years put together. With the exception of neurodegenerative, Everything's moving really fast. We're making huge strides on stem cells, on organ regeneration. You've got a lot of choice of where you can invest. So it's a question of finding things where the science is A, world-class, B, highly differentiated, C, potentially very valuable. Obviously, biotech, as we know, is a much higher risk investment. Um, and you look for undervalued companies which give you optimized returns. 
Yeah. So how do you find good companies that are under, underpriced? We have two professors of biochemistry who advise us on the science. And without them, we don't do anything. Unlike tech, you can't fake it till you make it. And then, you know, the other thing that we really like is we really like some very cheap valuation. And the place where we consistently found all those three things has been in the United Kingdom. So why, why do you think they're so undervalued? Because I think it's true of all British um, scientific companies. Your statement is very generic, very broad basis. This is a UK very... UK companies in general are Generally undervalued. don't value growth correctly and don't value scientific companies uh, that do a lot of research and development. You know, the City of London is a huge financial um, powerhouse, but in these particular areas, uh, venture capital, and taking what is undoubtedly world-class research and turning it into world-class development has been a perpetual British failure, you know, since the war. You know, Alan Turing built the first computer. It's generally not known, but Churchill ordered the thing to be destroyed once the war was over because he couldn't see any purpose for it. Meanwhile, in America, the story was slightly different. We've seen this during COVID. I mean, Britain's done more gene sequencing of the COVID variants than any other uh, country, for example. There's just this perpetual failure to turn this into commercial products. But in there lies the opportunity. Just in the same way that in this part of the world, in Southeast Asia, we have ignored venture capital, I believe in the next 10 years, UK biotechnology and Southeast Asia and this regional venture capital will be two of the most exciting areas to invest in. They fit beautifully into our highly risky part of the barbell. And so I don't feel you know, the need to really look many other places. The barbell is an evergreen strategy to go through a business cycle. Economic collapse, breakdown in civilization, maybe not, but in most normal, planable circumstances, we'll have this core level of assets that will continue to produce income. No one's ever really been able to perfectly describe a bubble. It's a futile exercise to try and work out when and why, but it's a very significant risk that it will happen. And if your portfolio is not ready for it, then you're speculating. To hear about Steve's biggest bet in biotech and his contrarian take on ESG opportunities in Southeast Asia, tune into the Lunch with Masters of Finance podcast at channelnewsasia.com slash listen.